the whole chapter of Acts 26. And if you are not awake yet, ready for what Pastor Rick is going to be taking us today, the scripture says, wake up from your slumber. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We are being serious here. It's time to wake up from the slumber and be ready to receive the word of God. Amen. Add a blessing to your word, Lord. Acts 26. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. I regard to all the things which I am accused by the Jews, and I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today especially because you are an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since then, I have known about, they have known about me for a long time. And if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which the 12 tribes hope to attain is they earnestly serve God day and night. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the, high, from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them in all of the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being fiercely enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw a way, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, those who were joining me with me. And when they had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both the first in Damascus and also in Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having attained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to the small and to the great, stating nothing but the prophets and Moses has said was going to take place. That the Christ was to suffer, and by that reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying this in his offense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning has driven you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak him 
also with confidence since i am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice for this has not been done in a corner king agrippa do you believe the prophets and i know that you do agrippa replied to paul in a short time you will persuade me to become a christian and paul said i would wish to god that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for the chains. The king stood up, the governor Bernice and those who were sitting with him. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, this man has done nothing worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Pastor. Let's bow our heads together, shall we? We're grateful, Father, for another opportunity to worship you today. And we're aware that there are many in our midst who are struggling. I talked with a wonderful member of our congregation this morning who told me just moments ago that Ryder was the seventh, the seventh death that has occurred in the past short time in her life. Her and her husband and her family have been going through difficult times of loss and grief, and, and they're not the only ones. So many of us have experienced 2020 thinking, well, 2021 is going to get better. And so far, it hasn't when it comes to sadness, and when it comes to sickness, and when it comes to difficulties. But as Pastor David said, you're in this place. This is what we call the sanctuary. It's the, it's the place where we could put our troubles and our trials and our difficulties and losses aside for a while and get refreshed and filled up and encouraged with your word. We pray that today that the insights that we, we gain will be encouraging and convicting and all that they need to be specifically for our souls. The wonderful thing, Father, about this incredible book called the Bible is that your Holy Spirit takes what I speak on Sunday and applies it to every single individual who's here. If we're alert, if we're awake, if we're responsive, there will be something for all of us, including myself, so that we could walk out in some area changed. To make this time special and significant, we pray that you would find responsive hearts here today. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. In the year 1968, a young man earned a degree in zoology from Syracuse University. The man had applied to many, many medical schools all throughout the United States and was rejected by every single one. They considered him a loser, not smart enough to attend their special schools. Eventually, he graduated from Syracuse University and then went on to earn a medical degree from the University of Utah. The man's name was Robert Jarvik. Robert Jarvik used his medical brilliance to create the first permanent artificial heart and therefore revolutionized the way the medical community handles heart disease today. In fact, the whole world has been changed by the brilliance of this one man, but it would have never happened had he given up after those multiple rejections. There are thousands of Christians today in various churches who have dropped out of church services. They have basically given up and walked away from God and his people because they've been mistreated, they've been disked, they've been misunderstood and rejected like Robert Jarvex. I know of pastors who've had their ministries shattered by self-serving saints. Consequently, they quit the ministry and end up selling real estate or used cars. But if we push through our difficulties, if we stay with the Lord in the midst of perplexing problems, he always promises a prize. Now, you recall the great goal that God gave Paul back in chapter 23. So flip back there in your Bible just to refresh your mind because that's what's driving Paul through all these difficult experiences with political figures that he's dealing with. 
chapter 23 and verse 11. It says, on that night, immediately following, the Lord stood by Paul's side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, you must also witness at Rome. Paul, you're going to reach your goal. You're going to achieve your objective. You're going to get to the capital and be able to share with the largest number of people the good news of the gospel. But we're seeing it's a ragged and rugged route to reach Rome. Paul has gone through in chapter 23 a conspiracy of cruel Jews who were out to kill him. In chapter 24, he was bought before the Roman governor, Felix the Cat, who in his procrastination stuck Paul in prison and just forgot about him for 24 months. And then in chapter 26, Felix is replaced by Festus. And Festus, like Felix, is unsure how to handle this hot potato of Paul. See, Paul is a very controversial figure. We know he has committed no crimes against the Roman government. But the Jewish nation at large, led by the leaders, are out for Paul's hide. And they stir up trouble wherever he goes. And so Festus, like Felix before him, doesn't know what to do with this unusual man. And then all of a sudden, King Agrippa shows up in Caesarea, and Felix or Festus says, I'm going to hand the hot potato off to him. So Paul is being pushed around, shoved around, put down by religious and Roman rulers. He knows the rejection that Robert Jarvix has felt. Maybe you felt pushed around, knocked around, and shoved down by an employer, by individuals around you, or by circumstances that are outside of your control, such as great losses in life. But if we could learn to view some of the worst obstacles as opportunities and stepping stones for growth, God's glory will be accomplished through our worst experiences. It was less than two hours, less than two hours after Ryder was killed on that motorcycle that Martha was sitting there with several people witnessing and sharing the gospel and teaching them that God was using this experience to speak to their hearts about getting right with God. Isn't that great? She turned the obstacle into an opportunity. The day before Ryder went to be with the Lord, Bill Lentz lost his daughter through death. I walked up to him today and said, Bill, how are you doing? He said, Pastor, I need a bunch of cards from the church because I have a number of people that I've been talking to who want to come to church with me. You see how people could turn obstacles and opportunities in the worst circumstances of life? So no matter what you may be going through or dealing with today, God wants to turn that in a wonderful way. That's exactly what Paul is going to deal with. Now next week, it's going to really get harrowing as he has an adventure on sea and everything goes against Paul. But even in the midst of that misery, he still sees God working in his life. And this is what God's teaching us today. Stay with us through the tough times. Stay with us through the difficulties. If you are bothered, as many of us are, by the, by the new regime that's stepping into the United States, we need to stay with it and trust God through the leadership. And so God's going to continue to work in our lives as we put one foot in front of the other. Now, Paul is going to be presenting, uh, being presented to the potentate, King Agrippa, and Pastor David has read from you from chapter 26, but I want you to take a look at the last verses of chapter 25. On your outline, we'll just simply call that setting the scene for the arrival and the speaking of Paul. Verse 23 of chapter 25. So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice, that's his sleepover sister, amid great pomp and entered the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city at the command of Festus, 
Paul is brought in. See that little phrase, great pomp? It's the English or the Greek word fantasia. We have an English word fantasia. We also get fantastic from it. So robes are unfurled. Trumpets have sounded, dun, 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 dun. They make a big deal about the arrival of Agrippa, and Paul is brought before him, verses 24 to 27. Festus said, King Agrippa, all you gentlemen presented with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring he ought not to live any longer. But I found he's committed nothing worthy of death. And since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I've nothing definite about him to write to my Lord. Therefore, I have brought him before you, and all especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. It would be unreasonable for this governor to send a prisoner to the ultimate authority, which is the emperor, without formal charges. That would be considered a dereliction of duty, and he could be dismissed from his office. Now, we mentioned two weeks ago that Paul has appealed to Caesar. And as a Roman citizen, he had that right to go to the ultimate supreme court of his day. Once you appeal to Caesar, there's no stopping the process. So if Paul's going all the way to Caesar, he does not have to meet Agrippa at this point. He could push this aside and say, why should I talk to you? You're a peon, you're a peanut. I want to talk to the real man. Why then? Will Paul spend the time, as Pastor David has read for us this morning, giving a defense before Agrippa if he doesn't need to do so? The answer, Paul never passed up an opportunity to share the gospel. And that's the lesson for you and me as well today. You could be in a grocery store. You could be at a gas station. You could be meeting with friends or relatives. And whenever that opportunity arises, you seize the moment. Nothing else matters except the gospel. That's the most important message on planet Earth. And so Paul is going to give it. Chapter 26 and verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted, permitted to speak for yourself. Therefore, Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. And this leads, on your outline today, to the preaching of the Apostle Paul. What you're going to see is the longest recorded sermon of Paul in the book of Acts today. And you can notice in your outline, it's broken into several points. Paul begins with letter A, a brief review of his past. Verses 2 and 3. Now, in regard to all the things of which I'm accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you today, especially you, because you're an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. So I beg you to listen to me patiently. Now, Agrippa had spent several years living in Judea. He was also raised in Rome, where he had developed quite an education about Roman life and Jewish history. Many of you have heard of the works of Josephus. I have them in my office. Josephus was a Jewish historian who was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul. And Josephus sent 62 letters to Agrippa, acknowledging Agrippa's incredible knowledge of Jewish history. So historically, we know that what Paul is saying is not just blowing smoke up this man. He's actually saying, you are an expert. You're the best person that I could possibly talk to. Verses 4 and 5. So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and here at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they're willing to testify... I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect 
of our religion. Josephus described the Pharisees as a certain sect of the Jews who appear more religious than others. And that's a good statement because they were really into appearances. But they seem, he said, to interpret the laws very accurately. Now, we give the Pharisees today in the 21st century a bad rap. And rightly so because they were extremely legalistic and they were responsible for orchestrating the execution on a cross of our Savior. But we must never forget, theologically, those men were on target. If they lived today, in the last four years, the Pharisees would have been wearing the MAGA hats. They were the super conservatives. They were the right-wing fundamentalists. They were the people that you would agree with theologically. And Paul, in his past, was part of that great theological group of people until he met the Savior. And so he said, that's a brief view of my past. And he said, I want you to know right off the bat, letter B, I believe in the resurrection, verses 6 to 7. Now I'm standing trial today for the hope of a promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for that hope, O king, I'm being accused by the Jews. The phrase hope to attain means to arrive at a goal. And the word earnestly is used of an Olympic sprinter straining and stretching to touch the tape and to win the race. So what's Paul saying? For century after century, the Jewish nation has been reaching forth, have been straining, have been hoping, longing, and loving the return of a Redeemer. They all want a Messiah to come back and to cleanse them of their national sin and to set up a kingdom of righteousness. The hope of Israel is bound up in the regeneration and the resurrection of Christ. But the moment the Messiah showed up, they rejected him. Verse 8. Why is it an incredible considered among you that God does raise the dead? Raising the dead is an incredible act, isn't it? A retired psychologist was dying of cancer, and he wanted to preserve his body by freezing, just like Walt Disney. So he included in his will thousands of dollars for a steel capsule and liquid nitrogen to keep the body frozen at 200 degrees below centigrade. And he's kept today in Phoenix in a storage unit waiting for a cure from cancer. Now, did you know that if future generations of geneticists could copy the genetic codes or the gene patterns in the dried tissue of mummified bodies and place it in fertilized egg cells, those cells could grow into the exact copies of the men or women who were frozen decades before. They will look absolutely identical except for the emotions and the memories. So it's not the same individual. Many of you have attended funeral services and you have seen an open casket situation, a person that you once knew. And you look at them and ask the question, who is this? Listen, I've been by the bedside by people who have died. I've watched them in the process of dying, or I have showed up five minutes after they died. And I said to myself, who's that? Because the body is the same, but the essence of who we are goes on. The soul, the spirit, the immaterial, the eternal part goes on to live with the Lord. That's the part that we long for when we see Ryder someday in his brand new body, 
and for all of us who have lost others that we love as well, like your son, we'll see them someday. But God said, or Paul said, God could do something phenomenal if he wants to. At any point in time, he could miraculously bring the person who was dead back to life. He did that with Lazarus. He'd been dead for four days and four nights. And I don't know exactly what happened. His soul, his spirit left his body. And he was probably with the angels and the saints. And all of a sudden, he's in heaven and he hears a voice in, on earth in Israel shouting, Lazarus, come forth. And he goes, uh-oh, time to go. And he's out of heaven and back to earth. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. You know, when the leaders of the Sanhedrin were confronted with the irrefutable historical fact that Christ was risen from the dead, how did they respond? They created their fairy tale. They began to spread a lie. You could read it at the end of Matthew chapter 28. Tell the masses, the disciples stole the body, and we're going to pay you the big bucks to create this lie. Now remember, this was the Sanhedrin. Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin. He lived in that lie. He propagated that lie until he met the risen redeemer and realized, I can't live with the lie anymore. Jesus is actually alive. That's why he asked the question, why won't you people believe that God could raise the dead? I do. I've met the risen redeemer. I believe in the resurrection. Say that with me. I believe in the resurrection. That is the, the turning point of the Christian faith. That's why Easter is so special, and it's going to be coming up this year, and we're not going to be shut down this time. We're going to be here to celebrate the greatest day of the year, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul loved that, and he preached that, and he lived that. And all throughout the book of Acts, you read again and again and again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what separates us from all of the belief system and ism and philosophy on this planet. Because without the resurrection, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, we are of all people most to be pitied. The resurrection changes it all. Then he shifts gears now as he puts himself in his enemy's camp. He paints with swift strokes the picture of his past, reminding Agrippa he was a rabid, psychotic persecutor of the Christians at one point. And that brings us to letter C in the outline. I do believe in the resurrection, but letter C, I beat up the righteous. I was bad to the bone, verses 9 and 10. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. The Greek says, I threw in my pebble. Because every man on the leading body of the Sanhedrin was given an opportunity to vote when it came to people who were brought before trial. And in his hand was placed a white pebble for acquittal and a black pebble for con condemnation. And Paul said, I've tossed in many of those black stones, watching Christian after Christian after Christian go to their death. And I put my stamp of approval upon it. I wanted every saint dead. Verses 11 to 12. I punished them often in the synagogues. I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them, even to foreign cities. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. Paul said, I was enraged. He was fit to be tied. You could take the worst political leader in America today. A person that you'd like to take their picture on the wall and throw darts at. You can't stand them. If you met the Apostle Paul before he became a Christian, he'd be ten times worse 
than any political leader that you can't stand today. He was driven by hell itself. That's why it took over a year for the church at the Jerusalem to believe that the guy's actually saved. He's too evil. And child of God, if the Lord could save someone like Saul of Tarsus, <laughs> any friend or relative or neighbor down the street is not beyond hope. And that's true for any political person as well. And I have a little plaque on my wall made out of wood that Jim created that I look at each day. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 2, and it tells us to pray for our political leaders. When we have a leader who's in office that we adore, life is easy. When we have a leader in office we may not like, then we have to get serious about prayer. Then we have to start taking this individual to the throne of grace each day and asking God to perform the same miracle in his or her life that he performed in Saul of Tarsus. Amen? That was for free. I didn't write that down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trust it came from the Spirit of God. But Paul was a man that you wouldn't have wanted to spend time with before he became a Christian. In Acts chapter 9, it says he was just breathing, breathing threats and murder. Anger just spewing out of his mouth. He says he pursued people. It means to chase as if in a hunt. At one point, he was running so fast and so hard. He was like the fellow who said to his friend, I, I, I can't catch my breath. His friend said, with your breath, you should be thankful. <laughs> And that was Paul. He had the bad breath of hatred. No one wanted to be around him. On a search and destroy mission to dismember the body of Christ. I beat up the righteous. But then something happened. That's letter D. I was blown away by the ruler of glory. Verses 13 and 14. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, it was believed in the olden days you could wake up a sleepwalker just by calling his name. Paul's been asleep spiritually. He's in a slumber. And all of a sudden, a voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, and the man wakes up. And notice the first question that God has for this individual in verse 14. Why do you persecute me? He asks in verse 15, who are you? He goes, how can I persecute you? I never met you. Well, the way that happened is because he hurt God's people. We're the body of Christ. And so when you gossip about another person, you speak poorly about them. You do all you can to punish them. You're punishing Jesus. When I love you, I love Jesus. When I hate you, I hate Jesus. That's why he was so shocked. He says, I've never even met you before. How could I be persecuting you? And then the next statement he makes in verse 14, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. You know, in Bible times, they used to use oxen to pull the plows. And at first, the animals would uh, rebel and fling their heels back in protest against the beam. And so the farmers came up with an ingenious and cruel device. They would put sharp iron spikes on the beam. So when the animal would rear back in rebellion, that spike would puncture his flesh and he'd begin to bleed. And finally, even the most stubborn of oxen would ease off and do their job of plowing the field. The reason Saul of Tarsus is psychotic and so angry 
is because his conscience has been poked by goads for the last number of years. He's bleeding inside. The first major goad was in chapter 7 when he stood there and watched his friends throw stones to kill Stephen. And then he watched the way Stephen died. No malice, no hatred, just mercy and grace and forgiveness towards those who executed him. That drove Paul crazy. In the very next chapter, that gold was driving him. He starts persecuting. He starts breathing threats and murder. And every Christian that he met, every Christian that he cast the, the pebble for their death, everyone that he persecuted and tried to blaspheme, he watched their excellent attitudes. And consequently, he couldn't handle that. And the anger got worse and worse and worse and worse. Things may get worse, not better, politically in America. And if that happens, it just gives us an opportunity to become the goads in the consciences of those who persecute us. And we do that by having an excellent attitude, amen? amen. By not spewing forth hatred in return. By forgiving those who mistreat us, and every act makes them angrier and angrier and angrier. And that's what you want. You say, you're kidding. No, I'm not. You want people almost psychotic with anger because when they hate you that much, they're probably this close to accepting Christ. Remember, Saul was so close with all of his hatred. All God had to do was just to show up, and instantly he turned. The person that you have to really be concerned about is the person who has a ho-hum attitude towards the Christian faith and the church at large. They're the ones furthest away from glory. The people who are the angriest may be the closest. So pray for them. Continue to goad them in love. And you may be the one seeing them come to Christ. It's exactly happened with Saul of Tarsus. All that anger ended up working for glory. He said, I was blown away by the ruler of glory. It drove me nuts. I could not handle all the peace of these people. And so in verses 15 to 16, I said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then his first words were not, I love you, Paul, but get up. <laughs> Stand on your feet for this purpose I've appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you. The famous judge Oliver Wendell Holmes made this statement. A moment's insight is sometimes worth a life's full of experiences. All the varied and checkered and theological experiences of Paul's life were condensed into one magical, mystical, majestic moment when he met the master. And everything changed. When you truly meet Jesus, everything changes in your life. You have a new outlook in the way you treat people. You understand grace more than you ever have before. Obedience is not something you're forced to do. Obedience is something you want to do. And you find yourself acting and believing and looking at life like you've never looked at it before. What does that mean? It means you've met the master. And if that's not been true for you, then today at some point, get down on your knees and say, Lord, you know, I think I know you and I believe you, but I've never had that majestic life change. I want you to do that for me today. I want you to rearrange my whole life and my whole heart so that I will be like the Apostle Paul and everyone around me will say, something's happened to him. Something has changed her. Because that's exactly what happened when Saul met the Savior. And so everything changed for him. Instead of persecuting the church, he became persecuted by those who hated the church. 
I was blown away by the ruler of glory in the letter E. I broadcast the message of redemption. Verses 17 to 18. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, I'm sending you to them. He hated Gentiles as a Jewish leader. But God said, you're going to the people you hate to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. People today who are against Christianity and against the church are in the dominion of Satan. They're not just stubborn. They're not just rebellious. Satan has his grip upon them. They're in his rulership. God wants to turn people out of the leadership of Satan over to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ. Now he begins by saying, turning people from darkness into light. This is very significant because the scripture repeatedly uses light as a metaphor or a picture of salvation. We find that in Matthew chapter 4, nine times in the Gospel of John, Acts chapter 13, here in Acts 26, 2 Corinthians 4, Ephesians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 John 1 and 2. You get the point? It's all over the place. Don't get too angry at the non-Christian. They're stumbling in the dark. You share the gospel with them, they don't get it. You say, it makes so much sense. How come you can't capture it? Because they're in the dark. When you respond to Christ, the light turns on. And the light, incidentally, must stay on. That's why Jesus in the gospel of Matthew said, you don't take a light and hide it under the bushel. That's why we're open in the midst of a shutdown. Pastor John MacArthur was right when he said several months ago, if a church calls itself a church and remains shut down during this time, it is not a church. I don't care how much publicity it has. I don't care how many books the pastor has written. It's not a church. It's a gathering of folks for some reason. I don't know what the reason is. Churches stay open. All across this world today, there are Christians whose lives are being threatened, whose homes are being destroyed because they get up on a Sunday morning and they go to some little shack which is called a church, not knowing if they're going to be tortured or macheted to death before they come back home. And they stay open. God forgive us as a nation of churches for not remaining open. The light will shine. And I agree completely with Pastor Jack Hibbs, who was asked months ago after the church opened after a short shutdown. And people said, what if the government tells you again, shut down? And it did. Jack said, listen to my words, I will never lock the doors of this church again. And when he said that, I said, brother, I'm with you 120%. Amen. Because Jesus said the light must shine. You know, for the past 11 months, through this whole shutdown, even when they shut down the beaches, I, I'd climb over the yellow tape. <laughs> I'd go out surf with my friends. And I have friends in all the places I have surfed with, Ryder and me and Matthew and several of us in the church, and friends down at Oceanside and friends at Trestles and friends at churches and friends at Newport and friends at Huntington. And over the past 10 months, most of these people who are my friends who are not saved know I'm saved, know I'm a pastor, and guess what question they've asked me. Hey, have you shut your church or are you open? And I said, we always stay open. And every single solitary one of those unbelievers said, good for you. That's right. We're proud of you. The world is looking not for wimps. 
They're not going to be drawn to Christ and the Savior if we're huddling in, if we're shutting down and frightened behind our masks. We're going to have to shine the light. And when the light comes out, the world's going to be attracted to that light. And when they come to the light, they get the greatest gift of all. You know what the greatest gift of all? It's right there in that verse I read for you. The forgiveness of sins. Oh, man, there's nothing like that. Without forgiveness, you and I will never reach the gates of glory. And the statement is replete, Old and New Testament, the scriptures are, with promises that all of our sins have been forgiven. Because there's so many saints, maybe even a few of you today, who are thinking, I don't know, I know that God's forgiven most of my sins, but if he knew, and he does know, <laughs> what I did three weeks ago or three years ago or 30 years ago, I'm not sure if he's forgiven that. I might have to work a little bit harder. And the whole teaching of Scripture, especially because of Calvary, is no, it's all clean. I love Romans 4, 7. Happy are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been completely covered. They taught Matthew to surf when he was only five years of age. And all during those formative years, five, six, seven, and eight, when he was a little kid, I'd take him out surfing. And then when he was done surfing, he'd come and play in the beach because he was a kid. One of the things he enjoyed doing was taking a stick and writing there on the surf line his name in big, bold letters, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, Matthew. And he'd be so proud of it, and it looked wonderful. And it would remain there until the tide came up. <laughs> and the first wave covered over the letters and washed away every trace and the sand was clean. The letters of sin were etched deeply into your soul and mine. The Savior came. And with the high tide of his blood, he washed it away. And here's the great news. And some of you need to hear this. And if you cling on to this, this may be what you need to hear today. There's no record in heaven against you this morning. No record. If you've given your life to Christ, God shouts clean. And you get to heaven and say, Lord, what about that sin? And he said, what sin? It's all taken care of. Here's how you know if you really believe it. If you're beating up your spouse, your children, unsafe people, and others for their sins, you still don't believe your sins have been clean. That's the acid test. Because once you know that you know that you're completely clean before God, you're so excited, you can't wait to find someone who's blown it just to give them that same grip. Just pour it right out of your life. See, what I've just given you is the essence of the Christian faith. Everything else is fluff compared to that. When you get that down, you've got it. Your life changes, everyone's life changes. That's why Paul was able to forgive so many people because he was forgiven by God. Verses 19 to 20. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to that heavenly vision. I kept declaring both to those in Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the regions of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Wow. You know, Paul is in line with John the Baptist, Matthew 3, 2, and Jesus, Matthew 4, 17, and Peter, Acts 2, 38. What did Jesus and John the Baptist and Peter and Paul have in common? They had in common this principle. Say it with me. You prove your repentance by your performance. There are way too many people out there today who have a lip service towards God. They will sing the songs. They will cry the tears if you accurately mention what Calvary is all about. 
But it's not the songs and it's not the tears. It's not what's on my lips that what's important. It's in my life. It's that change that I just talked about a second ago. It's that unique and miraculous ability to forgive people who have failed me because I know God has forgiven me. And that's that first performance that comes out of my life. And there are many, many more performances to come. And don't be thrown by the word performance as if you have to prove to God that you're indeed saved. It's something that flows naturally and normally and easily out of your life. You want to love people. You want to forgive them. You want to be obedient. And when you do or say something dumb, you feel bad. Because you know that's not who you are. You're better than that. You're a saint. You're a righteous person. And you live to please the one who's forgiven you for all your failures. And when people see that, you're proving your repentance. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, here's how you know Christians. Know them by their fruit. Don't be afraid to be a fruit inspector. No fruit, no root, no life. Look for fruit in your life, look for it in others. When you fall in love with Jesus, the fruit begins to flow. And Paul preached that way according to the words that he shared with King Agrippa. Verses 21 to 23. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple. They tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to the small and the great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer. And by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So he said, I broadly and boldly proclaim the crucifixion and resurrection in every town I travel to. Crucifixion, resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection. Those are the terms of the Christian faith. That is the essence of your vocabulary. Christ died for your sins, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he rose from the dead. That's it. That's all you need to share with the person how their life could be changed if they believe that simple revolutionary fact. It completely altered the course and lifestyle of this individual. So he's preached his heart out that the people aren't going to be responsive as he hoped they would have. And that brings us to our second point, and that is the pathetic apathy of the politicians. There are two apathetic statements that survive and surface the first is this one. Paul, you're crazy. Verse 24. <laughs> While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Every intelligent Roman realizes the dead cannot be resurrected to talk with the living. Your mental musings, man, have made you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You have come unhinged. You're unsound. You're deranged. You're off the rails. You're a looney tune. Why do you think he said that? Because Paul told his story with great passion. Great intensity, great fervor. He was too exuberant about Christ. That's why. I'll never forget that Sunday night some years ago at 9.15. I was watching on television when the Angels won the World Series. Most of us remember where we're at that evening. Pretty exciting. Thousands and thousands of diehard fans shouting, banging blow-up sticks together. News media interviewed the people on the streets. They were screaming. They were dancing. They were jumping up and down. They were shouting. How did the news media respond to that? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Hey, what would happen if thousands of Christians began banging blow-up sticks together in the streets of the city of Orange? 
jumping up and down and shouting Jesus? How would our news media handle that? Interesting, isn't it? A lot of Christians believe this too. It's fine to go bonkers for a sports team. But never show any of that enthusiasm for the Savior who died and rose again. And I wonder which one of those two is going to count for eternity. The child of God, next time you get excited about a sports team, be as excited as you want to be. But ask yourself the question, is my excitement for Christ trumping my excitement for the team that I can't quit talking about? Let's get our priorities in order, sports fan. Paul had his priorities in order, and consequently, he was called a maniac, a madman. Verses 25 to 26. Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I utter words of sober truth. But the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him with confidence since I'm persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. Is it haven't been done in the corner? The news is out. Everyone knows that Jesus is alive. And then he turns to Herod Agrippa and puts the guy sizzling in the hot seat. Verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. That's a great question. He really puts him between a rock and a hard place. If he believes the prophets, he must concede Christ is the answer to all the Old Testament prophecies. But if he does that, he's going to look foolish before his Roman friends and is going to stir up tension in the minds of the Jewish people. But if he doesn't do that, then he himself is a blatant hypocrite. For how can a Jewish king not believe the Jewish prophets? So what's Paul doing? Paul's a great fisherman. He baits the hook and he makes sure that it fits snugly into Herod's mouth. We read about a pastor who was an ardent fisherman and he was performing a wedding service. And he asked the groom, do you promise to love, honor, and cherish this woman? He said, I do. He turned to the bride and said, okay, reel him in. <laughs> Paul's ready to reel him in. And child of God, when you're given the gospel, there comes a point when you've got to reel him in. That's when you ask the question, are you ready today to accept Christ as your Savior and Lord? That's when you've got your hand on the wheel. And then you wait for their response. Sometimes they say yes. And you pull them in for Christ. Other times, they're not ready. And that's exactly what Paul is experiencing in this case. It's pathetic responses. The first, Paul, you're crazy, which sounds cruel. The second is just as bad, if not even sadder. Here it is. Perhaps I'll come around. Perhaps I'll come around. Verse 28, King Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. Almost persuaded. Almost. Isn't it amazing how a person could be so close and yet so far away from God? A man came home from the Civil War for four years, he was dealing with sadness and suffering and sickness and blood and death all around him. And finally, after four years, he was going to have his opportunity to be with his loved ones and his family. And he reached the river, which separated him from his home on the hill on the opposite side. He could see his house. He was so excited, he jumped in the first boat he could find. They began to row across this river. And he didn't know that there was a leak in the boat. He reached the middle of the river at the deepest point and the boat sank and the soldier was not able to swim. So he went down to a watery grave as he could see his house and his loved ones in the distance. 
That's Herod Agrippa. John Bunyan, who wrote the classic Pilgrim's Progress, made a great statement. There is a way to hell from the gates of heaven. I have seen it more times than I care to count, and perhaps you have as well. A person gets so close to accepting their Savior, they can touch heaven. They could taste it. And then for some strange reason, they turn and walk in the opposite direction. So close is not good enough. The decision must be made to sell out to the Savior completely. The grip over so close and yet so far away. Verse 29. Paul said, oh, I wish to God, whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but all who hear me today might be the way I am, except for these chains. I don't want you to suffer like I have for the Savior, but I want you to know the Savior like I do. And the king stood up, and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them, when they'd gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, this man hasn't done anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. But once you appeal to Caesar, you can't stop the process. You have to go all the way to the top. And so Herod, like Felix before him, just conveniently sidesteps the Savior. He hears the message. He hears the story of grace. He hears the reality of the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins. All of it sounds wonderful. All of it sounds terrific. But he's not ready to make the decision. And so Herod Agrippa walks away from this living in his own dreamland, just like Saul was once in his dreamland, spiritually asleep. Pastor John Orberg writes, I have a friend who had to take an international flight and wanted to sleep. Ever take an international flight? 1990, I went to India. 2004, I went to the Maldive Islands, just south of India, to surf and to minister. 24-hour flight. I was grabbing everything I can to put me to sleep, whatever it takes, you know. I don't want to be stuck in that plane for 24 hours just looking at the ceiling. That's exactly how this guy felt. So someone gave him the sedative Ambien. He was skeptical. He took a pill. Nothing happened. He took a second Ambien. Nothing happened. He took a third Ambien and washed it down with a large glass of wine. When he woke up, he was sitting at a strange terminal in a wheelchair, drool all over his shirt. He slept so hard the flight attendant could not wake him up. And when the plane landed, they just wheeled him outside and left him drooling. Sin is a spiritual ambient. You and I exist in a world out there of people in wheelchairs who are drooling all over themselves and they're not even aware of it. Now, if in some area of your life today you have allowed the spiritual ambient to put you spiritually a slave. God is asking you before you leave today to wake up. Let's bow our heads together. You know what's possible for you to be a saint? For me to be a saint and still live in a spiritual slumber? The Spirit of God speaks to us just like he spoke to Saul on the road to Damascus. And maybe right now he's asking you to alter an unacceptable attitude. To end a bad behavior. I don't know what that attitude or behavior is. It's none of my business. But you know and the Spirit of God knows 
And God's going to continue to whisper in your ear, please, child of God, don't take another Ambien and wash it down with wine. Stay alert. Stay awake. And seize the moment right now. See, right where you're seated there, you could do business with God. You could tell him, I'm ready to change this attitude, Lord. I'm ready to alter this behavior. You've been talking to me about this for a long time. I had a brother last night talk to me about a miraculous change after I gave the message that the Spirit of God had been speaking to him about for years. And finally, everything came to a point in his life when his attitude and behavior was radically altered. It could happen to you right now. So I'm going to have just a moment of silence. I'm going to ask you to talk to God about the area in which he's talking to you about. Do that right now. You could be spiritually asleep completely today. You've taken so many ambient over your life that you're even unaware of the fact that the Savior died for you. But today, this message is causing you to wake up to the reality of the resurrection of Christ and his ability to change your life. And here you're seated and you're listening and the Spirit of God is saying, this is the moment for you to have a momentous, miraculous experience like the Apostle Paul. It's time to wake up and to give your life completely to Christ. You say, that touched my heart, Pastor. That's what I need to do today. You've never fully given your life to Christ. Today is the day you're going to make that happen. And you'd like me to pray along with you. If that's your heart's desire, then I want you to lift your head and you connect with me in the eyes. And in doing so, I will know of your desire and we'll pray together right now. You can do that right now. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Let's pray together. Dear Father, I thank you for the great gift of forgiveness you offer me because of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I embrace him as my redeemer today. I want the world to see a changed person full of joy, full of peace, full of purpose, and most importantly, full of forgiveness. I'm going to be like Jesus to all the people I meet from this point on. Change my life. I know you'll answer this prayer. I'm excited about what you're going to do. Thank you for the change that's about to take place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all. We invite up our worship team at this time.